So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel. If you would like to learn anything more about what, I, what I'm go going to say about them, please look in the link in the chat with their full bios. So first we have George Empanza, Director of Enslaved, the Lost History of the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Jordan Panza is a multiple award-winning BAFTA-nominated filmmaker. Most recently, he was director on Enslaved, a new six-part documentary series hosted by Samuel L. Jackson that brings home the horror of slavery to the world through underwater archaeology. R.T. Thorne, my man, creator, executive producer, director of Utopia Falls, and so much more. Uh, since debuting on the music video filmmaking scene over 10 years ago, I think we have to update that, RT. It's been longer, longer than that. Hey, man, uh, don't try to age me. Don't try to age me too much. <laughs> RT has established a career as a director, producer, and screenwriter focusing on stories that break new ground representing the unrepresented. In 2020, he created Utopia Falls, as I mentioned, an Afrofuturistic sci fi series, and is currently in pre production on the CBC BET historical drama The Porter. Ron E. Scott, showrunner and director, Tribal. Ron E. Scott is an award-winning showrunner and director with over 25 years of industry experience. He founded Prairie Dog Film and Television and has been involved in creating five scripted series. His projects have been nominated for over 150 awards, including Best Dramatic Series and Best Writing Drama at the Canadian Screen Awards. And joining Ron, George, and RT is Sharon Lee director of Endlings. Named one of the Hollywood Reporter's 2018 Rising Stars, Sharon is the award-winning director of web series Someone Not There, as well as short films Benjamin and The Things You Think I'm Thinking. I love that title, which is screened at over 80 film festivals across the globe. Her TV credits include Murdoch Mysteries, Hudson and Rex, Coroner, Kim's Convenience, Odd Squad, Dino Dana, and Endlings, of course. Joining the group is Tiffany Sheng, director of Lockdown. Tiffany is a Peabody Award-winning filmmaker. Her film Sing Me a Lullaby has won seven awards, including the Directors Guild of Canada Best Short Film Award, and has most recently been nominated for our own Canadian Screen Award for Best Short Documentary. Her latest short documentary, Until Further Notice, had a Toronto premiere this year at Hot Docs. And I will pass it now off to our moderator for the session, J.P. LaRock, who is a television writer, producer, and journalist. J.P. LaRock has worked on shows such as Corner, Jan, Digstown, Another Life, and has bylines in the Toronto Star, The Walrus, and more. He is also the creator and executive producer of the Out TV digital series, Gay Nerds. A proud member of both the LGBTQ plus and BIPOC communities, JP is committed to diversity and inclusion in all of his work. Thank you, all of you, and welcome. Have a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, that great introduction. I feel like this panel is so ex like is so wonderfully experienced, and there's like such a a breadth of like the projects that you all have worked on. Um, I feel I feel like even when coming into this talk, I was like how do I possibly funnel these questions into given, you know, all of you working in different genres, whether you're, you know, working in doc, whether you're working in scripted, some digital, the features, like you're, you're doing a lot of different work and many of you have actually even moved between genres. So um, George, RT, Ron, Sharon, and Tiffany, thank you for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I wanted to kind of give you kind of a broad sense of like the chat. I was hoping to kind of start off a little bit kind of more broad in terms of talking about craft creative inspiration, you know, in terms of kind of how you got into kind of what you do and what inspires you, then talking a bit about kind of the process of collaboration, because obviously working as a, a director is really fundamentally about collaboration. Um, then moved to talking a bit about kind of the industry and how the industry has been shifting, um, kind of both in terms of content and as well as kind of behind the scenes and how that has impacted your work. Um, and then a kind of end off on like a, an inspiring note for aspiring directors, um, kind of advice you have about um, the journeys you've taken and, and you know, things that you that you enjoyed doing, that you were happy about, things that maybe you would do differently if you were in, you know, a different place now. Uh, but yeah, imparting basically your your accumulated craft knowledge uh, to those listening. So um, I think in terms of starting things off, I wanted to talk 
about, you know, again, and looking at kind of the work that you folks have done and, and you know, and, and whether, you know, it's like Utopia Falls, whether it's tribal, whether it's endlings, like there's, there is, again, very, very different projects, but all that nonetheless kind of possess very clear sensibilities, you know, in terms of your voices as filmmakers. And I wanted to ask you kind of off the top, like, what was, if you were to use reference points, like projects that have shaped your sensibilities over time, like things that kind of, I mean, this is a, this is a broad way of basically asking the question, how did you discover that you wanted to become a director? What was the thing? Was it a TV show you saw, a movie? What was it, was it a project in particular that moved you, uh, but that kind of led you on this path? Um, and I guess if I could start off uh, with George, if you, would, if you would like to tackle that question. Oh, you're on mute. Right, right. Can you hear? Am I off mute now? You are. <laughs> um, thank you very much, JP, and um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, when I say here, I'm talking about my living room uh, here in um, in London, in Fulham. For those of you that know, but it's um, a, a real pleasure, uh, uh, an honour, and a privilege to be amongst some really impressive people by the sound of it, creative people. So I'm very, very uh, proud to um, consider you as my peer group. Um, so yeah, the question, JP, what just really, what, what, what's, what, what inspired, what was the first thing that made me think I wanted to be a filmmaker? Um, you know, I went to art college and actually I started with painting and then um, I got into sculpture and then I got into photography and then I got into film. So that was sort of the, 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 the pathway or trajectory. Um, I remember watching uh, Mean Streets by Martin Scorsese when I was uh, about 21. And I literally became obsessed with that movie. And I think there was a, a period of about a year or two where I literally couldn't go to sleep at night unless I'd watched Mean Streets that evening on, on my VCR. Uh, it kind of had a sedative effect on me, but I was just obsessed. And what I recognized or what I felt I, I, I felt from the film was a real sense of something that was a drama, but also a documentary. And that was actually about real life. If, if for, for the, any of you that seen the movie, it starts with this um, Italian festival that's held in New York. And um, I think it's the feast of, it's a, you know, one of the saints, Italian saints, and it's filmed it's actually filmed as a documentary, but and the and the drama sort of starts from this sort of real real sort of scenario, and that I was just inspired the creativity of it, the like I say the documentary realism, but at the same time the expressiveness, the expressionistic aspects of the film, you know, the um, which speak to uh, Martin Scorsese's um, I guess obsessions you could call it, you know, and um, preoccupations, you know, to do with the spiritual. Uh, you know, as well as to do with the flesh and, you know, what makes us very human and what connects us to the ground and, or the street, if you want to call it that. So that's how I would say that that film played a large part in, in me thinking I, I wanted to become a filmmaker and try and do the something, do the same thing, I guess. Well, I was going to say, I'm like, in looking, kind of looking at Enslaved, it's like you can definitely see those elements coming through in the work. Like, it's like, you know, if you talk, I mean, again, Mean Streets is very different, um, but in terms of kind of talking about like the visual language and talk in terms of talking about kind of like that that um, kind of like sublime realism, like is definitely present in both projects. So that definitely carried through. Um, RT, if you'd wanted to kind of speak a bit, of, a, bit a bit about your motivations or inspirations. Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I grew up, uh, I grew up actually like started my, you know, I was born in Calgary, Alberta. So I was out there um, kind of in a very small isolated Caribbean community. And when I say <laughs> very small, like, like four families at the time, you know, it was like, it wasn't very big. So I, you know, when I was younger, I was, I was, you know, interestingly enough, like George, I was into art. I was into drawing. I, I was sort of a very internal kid and I used to draw a lot and, so there's, there's, there's a sort of like um, the influence of like comic books and, and sort of mythology, uh, these, 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 these stories, that's really kind of bled into me really early in my life um, because of my brother. 
And for a while, I thought I was going to try to do comic book artists and blah, blah, blah. You know, Caribbean moms, they're not about that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they're not about, <laughs> like, I'm glad you can draw, but like, you know. Um, but uh, I actually, it was actually, I would say, on the journey to kind of trying to figure out what it was that I wanted to do. I did like telling stories through drawings, um, but it was really, I would say probably, it was probably Spike Lee's uh, Do the Right Thing. That was, that was the one, you know, I saw that film and it was, it was like, I think probably the first film that clicked in my mind that was like, oh, films can say something, you know, they really, they can, they can have a mess. It's not just entertainment. It's not just fun. It's not just whatever, but you can say something and you can say, you can make people feel things. You know, that was the thing about that film is that it just really, you know, such a, you know, it makes you feel all types of things. You're angry, you're mad, you're, you're laughing, you, 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 you know, and, um, and also just this real storytelling about the community, which was, you know, uh, you know, also interestingly enough, you see in a lot of Italian cinema as well, which is really much about the community, how, how the community is impacted and whatnot. So, so that film uh, really, um, you know, put me on a path of like, you know, there, there are things to be said um, with this art form. And, and then from there, it was, a, it was actually a translation that happened a little bit later, but I realized that I was drawing uh, what I thought were comic book panels, but I was really drawing storyboards, you know what I'm saying? And that's, that's how my two sort of loves kind of came together. And then obviously I, I, I you know, I kind of came up in, in like the sort of hip hop, the golden age of hip hop, right? So, so I was really influenced by the music I was thinking and, and people were, you know, people were saying things um, back then in hip hop a lot. So, you know, that, that all kind of uh, came together and, and led me down the path of, of first music videos and then, you know, further on. And I mean, like, that, again, that is also incredibly evident in Utopia Falls. I mean, for me, the thing that I was blown away with when I was watching the show is the fact that, like, in terms of making bold choices, I think that as Canadian creators, we're always kind of like, be careful with your needle drops. <laughs> like, they're very expensive. And when I was watching your show, I was like, how in the world did you get this soundtrack? <laughs> like, this is incredible. <laughs> but it's, in the, it's, it's literally baked into the DNA of what the show is and what the, the story you're telling, right? So it is really... Um, it is really cool the way in which you were able to bring all of those sensibilities through um, and have that manifest in the show. Um, yeah, in terms of, again, that, that marriage of kind of like the superhero, the, the, the sci-fi, the hip hop of it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, sure. Tiffany, I, I, was, I wanted to ask you in terms of um, your inspirations. Oh my God, inspiration. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys, I feel like maybe some of you might have been also experience being raised by television <laughs> and movies. Yes. I had, you know, two very hardworking parents and, um, and, you know, there wasn't really the need for childcare when you had a television running. So I think I, I grew up getting lost in, in magic and stories um, away from maybe some of the harsh realities of things that I was facing, but really was just lost in magic. I think one of the very first movies that I obsessed over when I was a kid was Back to the Future. I was just like, so, oh my, I like, I went to go find a vest like that just so, you know, I could be <laughs> one with uh, with Marty there. But um, I started off with magic and, and, and I think how much that saved me um, as a kid. And then growing up further on, um, kind of similar to you, George, loved photography, got lost in photography um, in high school and in the dark room, got real high from those fumes maybe. <laughs> and then I, at one point, you know, like I guess the practical Chinese brain came in and it was like, okay, you're gonna go to school for learning a skill of photography or what is what what can I do more um, to to express and to tell stories and it was very practical for me to think about going into film. Um, and I think one of the films that really brought my the sense of urgency to to be a storyteller and to want more of it was watching Eat Drink Man Love Angley. I mean it was something that I hadn't seen before that allowed me to feel 
like I was represented on the screen, like family dynamics that were complicated and messed up, but also the nuances around food and, 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 and sharing food together really spoke to me. And there wasn't many for me to, to identify with um, while growing up. And I realized very quickly that the angry, Asian lesbian filmmaker in me when I went into film school had been embodied by this lack of and wanting more of and I think that that really pushed me into carving out and trying to navigate because there weren't a lot of role models either to see myself and prove to my parents that this was a viable future. I'm still trying to prove that actually for my kidding. <laughs> so that that really is is kind of wanting to see more of something that I wish I had more of growing up and knowing that um, if, you know, knowing that it starts with people, more of us to doing that, to, to carve out those stories. And so um, here I am still trucking along. <laughs> right on. Uh, Sharon? Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think for me, I have a kind of different path because as a kid, I wanted to become an actor ever since, as for as long as I could remember, I wanted to be an actor. And I remember being 12 years old and people asking me why. And um, I would say, I think it's the best way to learn about the world because you actually have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And to be a good actor, you need to like know all the backstory and really feel how this character feels. So my whole life, I. I, my parents thought it was a phase. I was adamant it was what I was gonna do. I did not grow out of it. I went to university. I studied uh, um, marketing and organizational behavior, but I still wanted to be an actor. I was like, I'm gonna audition as soon as I graduate. I was doing musical theater. I was just still performing, taking, you know, singing lessons and dance lessons, and guitar, all of that. Um, and then randomly, I saw these flyers around campus looking for directors. And the thought had never entered my, my mind that I could direct, but I worked with directors my whole life, my whole young life. And I was like, oh, this is, this makes me nervous, but it, it, you know that good kind of nervous. Um, so I just went for it. I directed this play. And I never acted again. <laughs> <laughs> so I think for me, ultimately, it was really about empathy. And being able to direct made me realize that I have more, I can actually, I have to do that work for every single character. And I also have more control over the story and try to say something with the story. And as a kid, you know, I was always, you know, student council president and I was always a leader and it just, it just made so much sense to me. It just like came into my life and then I was like, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> so, and I'm, I'm also not, um, you know, kind of also I'm an immigrant myself and didn't have a lot of, uh, I don't, I definitely am not like a movie buff and I have a lot of catching up to do. But my, my path really came from me really leaning into like the images in my head and uh, replicating those things on screen and thinking that they were pretty conventional and then discovering that that's my voice. And yeah, so it's been great. That's great. Uh, and Ron? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> First of all, I just want to thank the Academy for recognizing the Indigenous land that uh, we all are on in Canada and North America. And I do appreciate that there was a, um, a recogni recognition for the people that have gone through uh, generations of difficulty and challenge. So, and thank you for having me. And I do feel honored to be on, uh, you know, on the same screen as, as all of you. So. Uh, growing up, I um, wanted to be an actor as well, and uh, you know, it was in love with movies and storytelling and communication. And it's just such a big kind of envelope to kind of digest as a young person that I ended up going to film school and uh, just really falling in love with the craft 
of you know the visual medium and the the narrative that can that and commentary that can come from uh, you know whether it be visual storytelling, filmmaking, or TV. And uh, you know, early in my career, I uh, I spent a lot of time interviewing a lot of um, native and non-native uh, people through starting uh, you know kind of reality slash documentary style filmmaking. And as a, a Métis myself with a um, Cree background, I just found myself gravitating towards this, uh, my identity from my mother's side. So I started to kind of explore that a bit more. And uh, I grew up in a neighborhood where it wasn't very cool to be uh, what we were called as Indians. And so, you know, I, it was a very kind of uh, suppressed part of my past that I, I never really was allowed to kind of uh, indulge in it or expose it or be able to kind of uh, just pursue it. So I started, um, you know, kind of swimming in both worlds. Uh, I'm part Native, I'm part non-Native. So I, uh, all my shows kind of reflect that. And then I, I ran into the uh, amazing project that would become Blackstone. So uh, I, first of all, um, you know, we spent a lot of time, the people that uh, created that in crafting it in such a way that it was confrontational. It was bringing up issues that just hadn't been discussed. You know, uh, I do want to give props to Moccasin Flats uh, before uh, they kind of laid the groundwork for that. But then we came in with this next level, uh, no holds barred. Um, yeah, it's tough in the neighborhoods, but there's still hope. And so um, I direct, ended up directing the pilot and then directed all five seasons. Because what I found was when it's on the page and then when it goes from the page into execution, there, there, there might be some disconnect if there isn't that kind of filter or that understanding of culture uh, within the community. And I really found that, uh, you know, there'd be times where, you know, people will, you can't do that. You can't say that. Our, our first cuts came back from the broadcast going, you can't use that song. You can't sing that. I said, yes, we can. This is the identity within the community and we need a voice and it needs to be authentic. It's going to ring true. So um, it kind of catapulted me into directing so that I could execute the material from the page, from the stories, and then add those nuanced, um, real kind of cultural aspects to it that sometimes uh, there might be a trepidation from a non-native person uh, to actually do that. Or, you know, our, our story consultant, uh, script consultant said, you can't have a nine-year-old swear. Well, I said, you know what? I grew up in a harsh neighborhood where I knew every swear word before I was eight years old. So, so do we want to tell the true story here? Do we want to be authentic? Do we want to be real? Or do we want to, uh, you know, call it apple polish? Do you want to just colonialize the story? Or do you want to tell the, something that's authentic? And uh, Blackstone is, was uh, as authentic as we could make it. Uh, it was confrontational and it was uh, something that I'm very proud of. And it, uh, it, it, it kind of, uh, you know, launched my kind of directing career, being able to kind of uh, direct every episode of it and just have that, you know, ability to be that filter and to that voice and be that commentary. That was great. Um, I, it is actually really interesting because I feel like my next question builds off of um, kind of what you're what you're speaking to kind of when, you know, if you're working within genre, uh, you know, one of the things about being a director is that sometimes you have the ability to shepherd your own project and kind of be the creative force behind it. Then other times you might be brought in as a bit of a hired gun to work on somebody else's project. You know, in speaking to kind of each of your own kind of individual experiences, your own artistic voices, like how do you, like what do you consider to kind of be the biggest difference between working on kind of like your own kind of um, passion project versus a project that you're kind of brought into when it's already um, kind of, the wheels are already in motion, it's already kind of its own machine. And then also the second part of that is also how do you maintain voice? How do you bring your own voice through you know, if there is this kind of like, let's say a pre-established structure or it is a procedural show or it is, you know, something that, um, you know, like Tiffany, for instance, I know that you, you know, you work a lot in doc, but you also like, you know, with, with lockdown, it's like lockdown is, is a very different thing. So like, how do you um, find a way to bring your sensibility forward, um, both kind of in your own self-directed projects versus the projects that you're kind of hired on uh, to come on and collaborate on? 
Uh, thank you, JP. I, you know, it's funny because I'm in such a space where there's such, you know, veteran uh, TV directors here, and this is definitely a new space for me in the last couple of years to navigate. Um, I've been very privileged. Um, I have a lot of gratitude that fact that I've been working on my own stories and being able to do documentary around the world and to now navigate into the fiction realm, into television. Um, it is it's something that I found, I, you know, the learning curve wasn't that great. Um, it was really understanding your purpose on set uh, very quickly and realizing how you can, how you can support, how are you part of the supporting role um, and not about like fighting for your, you know, the baby that, you know, you've written and, and funded and you need everyone to jump on board. It's a different type of leadership where I felt like it has definitely taught me a lot of discipline and something that I now also apply it to my own films and my own documentaries. I think a lot of the skills definitely lean and lend itself to one another. Um, I feel like I'm a, like I'm at my best in chaos. I know that sounds really weird, but in documentary, anything goes and anything can happen. So I can manage chaos quite well. And to be able to have the opportunity of working with, you know, 50 plus people um, to support um, that scene, that episode is, you know, it's like a, I'm at a kid at a candy store. And I think that when I realize what I, what my, what my purpose, how I lend my own voice to is actually the way that I communicate with people um, behind the camera, you know, not only to crew and getting to know them, um, but also the cast as well. I think that to me, building that relationship and that trust, um, that is unique to my voice, uh, that is unique to my lived experience, that is unique because I've spent, you know, 15 years of my life listening and understanding the nuance in people to truly get the best out of them in their performance. Um, and that to me is, it's, it's all about relationship, you know, whether it's in fiction or documentary. And I put that as a priority as well as a priority of listening to showrunners. And I think one of the best things for me that I got an opportunity to do on lockdown was meet the writers. You know, rarely you get that opportunity to really sit down and really understand the, the motivation um, behind it, to really understand, you know, what they are trying to get out of it as well, and to make sure that I am going to do it justice. I think it's a huge responsibility when you get that opportunity to put their words on screen and to deliver, you know, someone else's baby, essentially, right? Um, that's why also, you know, like this whole idea of like babysitting someone else's kid and you like your more fear almost because you like don't want to kill the kid. I know that's really morbid. We don't need to go, go down that route. <laughs> but there is this feeling of like, you want to take extra special care because you yourself as an independent filmmaker, you know how hard it takes to have an idea, to finally get it workshop, to finally get the writers together, to finally get the funding, to finally get the network to sign on board. You yourself know all the steps it takes. So when you finally get there, and you bring someone else on board to direct it, like I have so much gratitude and I have so much respect for that process that I want to make sure that I do everything in my skill set to, to lean into it, to provide the best way to shape that story in their vision as well and to offer my own unique skills, which is my relationships with people. Um, I think that's what I can really bring to each story that I'm allowed to tell. That's great. And I mean, I feel like the, the, the relationships piece, right? Because it's like yeah. with Doc, building those relationships is so central to the storytelling. So then when you find those relationships kind of in the text itself, when you're dealing with a script, when you're on set, you're dealing with actors. It's building that kind of that human language that kind of is the connective thread, which is cool. Um, remember that it's always, it's not about the end product, but around the process and the enjoyment of it for not just your cast, but crew as well. How do we make the process more enjoyable, you know? And then I, I'm almost certain that the end product will be amazing, you know, and, and being very mindful of, of the process. Right on. Um, now, Sharon, I actually wanted to kind of also direct that question to you as well, uh, largely because, again, you know, like looking at your CV, you've done like you did Kim's, you know, you did Coroner, you have Endlings, which is obviously very different as well, uh, plus your shorts, which, you know, obviously are, are different from those two. So 
for, for yourself, how do you find kind of the, the unifying thing between those projects, the way in which you engage your own kind of personal artistic voice in each in each project? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think it's a question that everybody asks themselves. Um, and people ask me all the time. And when before I directed my first episode of television, I was I really asked myself that question. And now that I'm I've done more of it, um, truthfully, I think the answer that I always give myself is that it's the same. Like for me, I have to, I have to enter into this creative space with my a hundred percent, you know, me, and that's what I bring to the table. But like you said earlier on, when we first started this conversation, a large part of what we do as directors is we collaborate. And like Tiffany also so articulately said, was like we're we're here to support as directors on a television show somebody else's child and um that's super exciting for me because as a filmmaker we we don't when we when we work on our own thing we're so like set on this is me this is my voice this is my child and then when you can get to step away from that bubble and be able to offer yourself and your skills and your point of view to support somebody else, that exercise of like stretching your creativity is so valuable and makes us all better creatives. Um, but I think the approach to me is the same. I still have to, I, I think something that is obvious is that we can't escape ourselves, you know, as much as we want to like mold to other people, you are your container and you see the world through your eyes. And that is a great comfort to me because I know I can just trust, I, I know that there's nobody else out there who sees the world like I do. So that is inherent to the work. And then, and then so you don't have to like try so hard to like shove your perspective <laughs> into somebody else's, you know, work because it's there and so you can just bring yourself to the to the work and and then it'll mold itself um, based on everybody's um, point of views and what they offer that's great um i did also have a question i mean i feel like this is the thing that i on every panel within the canadian industry right now we're always we're talking about it we're talking about kind of the evolving nature of like what Canadian, what CanCon means, what is Canadian representation, what are Canadian stories? And one of the things that I found really, really fascinating um, uh, about, let's say something like, you know, with Utopia Falls or something like Tribal is, you know, these are stories that are, are very distinct in terms of having a very unique POV. They are stories that nonetheless are engaging with genre, um, kind of these pre-established genres that, um, you know, whether it's a procedural, whether we're talking about kind of like, you know, like a science fiction post-apocalyptic kind of narrative that have these long histories or traditions. And it's like when you're, you know, like as a director, when you're kind of coming into that as a creative force, are you finding that, you um, you're receiving the support, the industry support, uh, to make the kinds of projects that you want to make. Like, and I'm, I'm to me, I'm, I'm really fascinated. I guess this is directed specifically to Ron or to RT, but like, you know, when you have a project that, uh, whether it's Tribal or whether it's Utopia Falls, that kind of does have a very distinctive voice that is doing something very different with a pre-established genre. You know, did you find a lot of resistance to kind of bringing that 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 story to the screen? If, I guess RT, if you wanted to start. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, resistance, let me think about that. I don't feel like a show like Utopia Falls could have been made um, even five years ago. I think the time that it, that it had to be made was when it was made. Um, that, you know, um, I think there's a, a couple of factors I think that streamers had a big boom and it's no secret, you know, it's it, Hulu was um, really the, the, you know, the, the um, streamer that, that spearheaded it, you know, um, uh, I'll tell you the truth. I, I didn't, 
I didn't go and pitch it here in this country. You know what I'm saying? I pitched it down um, south of the border um, because um, there was nothing like it. There was nothing like it, period, um, on, on television. But I also just knowing the Canadian landscape and, and, and what was being produced in this country, um, it just, you know, I, I, I knew that it would not be really successful um, to try to start here. Uh, once we, you know, could get somebody down in the States, then I thought, you know, there might be an opportunity up here. But the streamers were more willing to do, um, you know, different concepts. They already, you know, you, you saw stuff popping up four or five years ago when really uh, the creation of it was happening on Netflix from different countries, Caribbean countries, uh, you know, South Asian places, you would see the programming made in those languages, in those cultures, for those cultures. And so the streamers, I think, really understood that there's a, you know, there's a world of people out there who do not get to see their cultures represented, and they will tune in. And, that, and the great thing with the, with the streamers, you can tune in anytime you want, and you can, you can, you can watch you know, stories that are told from your perspective or from your, your, your people's perspective. So knowing that, um, you know, I wouldn't say it was like, that's what I came up with. That's why I came up with it. But um, it, it definitely allowed for me to envision this kind of a thing. And, you know, in terms of science fiction, yeah, it was like, you know, the, the, the whole impetus of the thing was that I had never seen my culture represented in the future. And hip hop is the dominant pop culture future, <laughs> pop culture, um, you know, uh, force in the world. It is, it, is a, it is a music that is about people telling their story. <laughs> That's what it's based in. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about giving voice to the voiceless. So, you know, that's why there's hip hop all over the world. And so I said, you know, I've never seen a future you know, uh, where hip hop culture is represented. Um, and what ha you know, what do they listen to in the future? And that's where that sort of thing kind of sparked from. And, and you know, it was, it was less about, for me, an evolution of hip hop at that point. It was, you know, knowing that hip hop is this, this force uh, of, of, of political and social discourse and, and, and progress. Um, I could imagine that in one of these dystopian worlds, where they where they where they crush down the rights of the people, um, that they would they would try to erase um, hip hop uh, because they understand the, the the force that it could be, and that's where that story sort of came from, uh, this sort of erasure um, of culture, um, and uh, and then what happens when new young people in that time find it. So. Um, yeah, but it is the type of thing that I think could really only have been made in these past few years. Also, there was a, a, a push of people becoming more socially and politically aware, you know, uh, thankfully from social media as well. But people were, you know, they were they were getting more engaged in and especially young people were very much getting engaged in their lives and not being told that they shouldn't be caring about certain things or they shouldn't be uh, looking at certain things. So that also spurred along and, um, and, and sort of infused itself into the, into the narrative. So, yeah. That's great. Um, and I mean, Ron, I was gonna say like kind of building off of that, you know, with Tribal, one of the things that I found uh, most fascinating about that show is again, you know, you're dealing with uh, a procedural, you're dealing with kind of like a cop drama. Cop dramas historically from a narrative perspective kind of reinforce a certain type of colonialism, a certain type of control. Uh, but what I find so fascinating about it is that you, um, you know, you your show unpacks that on screen and is very indigenous in terms of kind of the, the point of view and the perspective that it brings kind of to the fore. Um, so I kind of wanted, I wanted to kind of hear, you know, in terms of uh, your ability to kind of craft that narrative and to be able to kind of push against the, the, um, the procedural elements and the expectations of that genre. No, sure. Great. Uh, you know, Tribal was always designed to be a progression of Indigenous storytelling. And uh, what was, uh, what was really exciting is that, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, have a strong female protagonist and, 
and some just some different characters that were professionals in the indigenous kind of uh, more urban setting, whereas traditionally, you know, a, lo a lot of content was on the reserves and, you know, that kind of world. And so we just wanted to progress these characters and have the ability to show that there are, you know, there is this type of, of person within this community that are, there are, they do operate in a big city and they do operate in legal and finance and, and police, policing and government. So that was always the goal of uh, coming into, you know, the, a female protagonist coming into a police department with the old boys club. And, and, you know, you could see that collision and that kind of how things could break down. And, and meanwhile, you know, there was a, a crime of the week. So it was definitely challenging to, um, to really uh, service the commentary within uh, the one hour procedural where you're not, you're, you're servicing also the crime, but you're servicing the characters. And so we wanted this character driven crime drama that has, you know, this indigenous voice and indigenous commentary. So that was really the heart of tribal and it continues to be, you know, in season two and now we're developing season three. So I find that we're just trying to progress every season to, you know, to show that there are issues that, you know, uh, need to be discussed and are interesting and they're not just always what you see in the headlines. For sure. And I mean, and that is, and that is uh, incredibly evident in the, in, in kind of in the way in which, you know, like I, I find that I, one of the things that I found most interesting about the show was the fact that our heroes are incredibly complex and you root for them, but you also sometimes have trouble rooting for them as well because they are very, uh, they go to some very dark places, right? So I think that, that you definitely captured that uh, on the show. Um, in terms of kind of building off of something that RT was saying before about, um, you know, the, the, you know, you're pitching projects, you're finding some challenges in terms of finding the infrastructural support to get a project off the ground in Canada alone. Um, a project I found really fascinating uh, was Enslaved, uh, George, in terms of kind of like, you know, this incredibly expansive doc series talking about, um, you know, the history of the slave trade, talking about kind of this this form of kind of archaeology of dig digging up what are essentially these kinds of grave sites and and the emotional weight of it. Um, and for me personally, I kind of I, I was wanted to know about how you kind of became involved with that project in particular, given the scope of it, because it is so massive. You have Sam you have someone like Samuel L. Jackson, <laughs> who's walking around on camera ninety percent of the time. Like, how did you become involved in that project? Um, yeah, well, I. I, I mean, basically, you talked about, you know, two types of project, you know, your passion project, your personal project, and then the big sort of, you know, machine uh, uh, that you then get invited to take part in and to sort of become a, a sort of, a, you know, a, a cog in that in that sort of machine. And, and, and but uh, it, that enslaved was definitely the latter you know i was uh, I, I was hired in um it was uh, a project that associated producers um uh, via simca Jacobivici um got off the ground i think the distributor was Fremantle. you know it's a lot of money involved uh, i don't know well over 13 14 million and um i just got you know, it's just one of those phone calls you sort of hope for when you're a freelancer, a freelance director. And um, uh, it was, uh, you know, just a real, real experience. I'm, if I'm being really honest with you, I just, when I knew I was going to work on it and, uh, you know, I had uh, my first day of filming with Samuel L. Jackson, my basic prayer was that I could just get through the filming without someone who I revere, you know, being Samuel L. Jackson, and it just, I'm pretty, I'm just in love with the guy, really. I was just hoping I could get through it without him thinking I was, an, you know, an a-hole and, 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 you know, just, um, and fortunately that, that happened, you know, Samuel was a sweetheart. And, you know, I think Sharon was talking about, you know, adapting as a director or Tiffany, you, you know, and being yourself on set and bringing yourself to, to the party and, I guess that's what you do. You know, I had to adapt pretty quickly to filming with someone of the stature of Samuel because, you know, going for second takes, that was always quite a hairy process. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
you know, you'd ask him, oh, can we do another thing? What, what the fuck? I don't know. I really did that shit, man. And, you know, I can't really do a Samuel L. Jackson impression. But he... You know, it was good, though. It was really good. <laughs> he, you know, and I, I kind of had to find a way of directing Sam without actually telling him what to do in any way, shape or form. So I would end up having conversations about what we needed for the next scene with someone who was sitting next to Sam. So, and then Sam would spend the whole, all of that time basically on his mobile phone, you know, looking and doing whatever he was doing. And then when you said action, everything I'd said, Sam had picked it up and added some change to it as well. It was really phenomenal, you know, and that's when you know you're, you're working with a, a top, top professional, an A-lister, uh, which is what it is. And, you know, I, I, one of the surreal moments I remember from directing Sam is that at one point we were, talk, we were filming and he was talking about his direct connection to slavery through his ancestors, through his grandmother. And... Um, as he was talking, you know, I was standing to, as you do, you know, to the, the, the side of the camera person. And my head was like, it was on an elastic band like that. That was pretty much it as far as the direction was concerned. But I could see Sam, he was constantly sort of looking out the side of his glasses towards me. And the more he looked at me, the more I was doing that. It, just keep on doing that, it's great. But it's, you know, it's a, a really humbling to think that, hey, someone like him, he's looking to me for some form of direction, even if it's just my head bouncing up and down and, you know, in, uh, in the, <laughs> trying to encourage him. But it was, um, yeah, it was uh, an amazing thing to be part of. I was very much a part of a, a big machine. I was a cog in the wheel. And, you know, I've, obviously it's a subject matter that's very close to my heart, being someone of, of African descent. Um, so yeah, a dream project. I, I found it, and I have to say, like, I found really how absence structures your that project in particular. Those gorgeous, gorgeous shots of kind of these spaces where human lives were, and kind of the cost of what the slave trade was. You, you, uh, it, it was very resonant. Like it was very. I, I watched it, and I, I had my Kleenex. I was crying quite a bit. So. Um, I did want to actually turn things to kind of the audience questions because I know that some folks kind of out there who are watching um, have some specific questions as well. Um, so I, I think that the Academy folks are going to send those along to me momentarily. JP, there's a couple there in the uh, Q&A. The Q&A button? button. Oh, right here. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the first question is, uh, from um, Gilbert Curry. Uh, how do you make your vision voice, uh, make sure that your vision uh, or voice is not lost on a new film series or series when there are cinematographers um, that you are working alongside? So basically a question about kind of collaborating with like a cinematographer who might have a very specific vision of their own, ensuring that you maintain your kind of own voice through them. Uh, if anyone wants to tackle that question. I'll start pointing people out. Tiffany, Maybe. do you want to answer that question? Oh, RT, RT's taking it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, um, I, I think like anything, you know, like it, it's, it's, it's a collaboration. If you're, if you're, uh, if you're fortunate enough to be, you know, the, 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 like, you know, quote unquote, the lead creative in that process and you're kind of determining that, then it's just about making sure that you articulate your vision, you know, and you, and you, and you provide a lot of, um, you know, reference points and and you all get engage in that. That's a rigorous process of sort of, you know, we, we, we all, when I say, you know, uh, when I say blue, everybody has a different shade in their head. So it's very important that in that process, you, you, you work on so that you're, you're speaking the same language, you know, um, when you're, you know, and you, 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 you make sure that you all are talking about the same things. You look at the same things, you discuss what you see in those things um, because we all see something different when we look at stuff. So, and then you kind of distill that language down so that you, you, you know, um, when you're talking about uh, a shot or a sequence, they understand exactly what you like. And that's, that's what people 
speak about when they talk about a shorthand. That's why we like to start to, you know, sometimes we like to work with a lot of the same people because you have that shorthand. You all know the, the, the certain language that you're talking about. And that goes across the board from cinematographers to uh, production designers, uh, to casting uh, people, you know, uh, to writers, you know, it's all, it's all refining that. And it's a, it's a difficult process. It, it doesn't always, you know, it doesn't always fully come together by the time that you are putting the thing together, but you keep working at it. And, um, and uh, but it's an exciting process too, because, you know, when, when you do, when you find those people that are, that you start speaking the same language and you guys, you know, you get each other, um, there's nothing like that. And that's magic. And you're working with your squad. And um, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. That's great. Uh, does anyone else want to tackle that or? Yeah, because uh, we have we have I have another question uh, in terms of like the challenges that you look forward to, you know, whenever you take on uh, your kind of a new directing project, a new writing project, what are the challenges that you look forward to in that process? I could answer that. I, I feel like I'm really excited about doing things and doing things unapologetically and being bold about it and doing it in a way where we can embrace entertaining the masses while having real powerful messaging. Um, I talk a lot about, I may destroy you. I know some of the <laughs> attendees could, uh, could agree to some of this, this like just the, the, the way that that show for me gets me so excited about what I can't wait to do, which is to be unapologetic, to put it out there, but also entertain the masses because it's not about, you know, preaching to the same choir that already knows this. It's actually about the people who have no idea and they think they're watching this and then boom, you hit them across the head and they're like, what the fuck just happened to me? Sorry, am I not allowed to swear on this thing? doesn't matter. I will not apologize. <laughs> Sorry with this panel. Um, I'm, I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited about some of the, you know, new directors that are coming out here in Canada, you know, I uh, just hot dogs just ended and I'm just seeing so much incredible work that's coming out here that I feel like, wow, our landscape is going to change for the better and I'm excited to be part of that to be with it and also to share my mistakes and my learnings you know because they don't have to be in vain and you be the only one who learns from that lesson and that that that's what makes me excited about you know up and coming work that I'm going to be doing more scripted stuff that really all of it derives from real life stories you know it's so funny when people like separate documentary and fiction like they're like two opposite water and oil type of thing but it it all blends and mends together. And, and it was exciting to see, you know, Nomadland win the Oscars, you know, because to me, that is like the purest form of how we can tell beautiful stories and using the best of both worlds, both genres to, to execute that type of storytelling. So I'm excited for all of that. It makes me feel optimistic as, you know, as, as optimistic as we can be during a global pandemic. <laughs> So you would, I mean, you would say that like you're seeing signs that the industry is changing for better. There, it, there's definitely a, a shift. It's it, it, ideally a more inclusive I'm seeing, shift. It's not the industry. It's because there's still so much work that we have to break down because it, you know, it was carved out a hundred years ago, and there's still some archaic things, and that's part of that model. I think I'm, ex I'm seeing change in us as individuals, you know, people, my colleagues, my peers who are feeling that, you know, burst of energy, and to be able to see as an example that our voices, our collective voices. Um, can shift and make choice, uh, changes and pivot things. You know, I, I see that, and I I want to I want to believe in that that we can actually make you know substantial changes. But it has to be has to be foundational change. It can't be superficial tokenized change, and that's the hard work. And but I'm committed to that, and I I appreciate now that you know we have spaces to at least start those types of dialogue. I mean, it, great. It, to, you know, to what Tiff is saying, like, I do feel like you're saying there are voices that are, we're stepping into that place now. And so, we're, you know, like, we're not waiting anymore for a chance. We're not waiting for somebody to give us a seat at the table. We're building a new table, you know what I'm saying? And, 
And that's a beautiful thing that this. I love that. that. I love that. <laughs> I stole that. I did. I, that, that was mine. I stole that from somebody. I stole that. From somebody. <laughs> I'm gonna use it too. Use yeah, it too. yeah. I think I think it, I think it's Warren Sonoda said something like that. But it's like you know, it, it is very much that there's a lot of filmmakers that have something to say from different cultures that are now stepping into that and are saying, and they're not being quiet about it. And I think that in itself as a movement it is really going to, it is, it, we can't be denied now, you know? So we, we've already been struggling. We know what the struggle is. So, you know, now we're stepping into it and it's a beautiful thing, like what you're saying. That's great. And I was gonna say like, in terms of, you know, building off of that, in terms of building off of these new exciting voices kind of coming into the industry, just in terms of kind of a general kind of aspiring for aspiring directors out there, um, like in terms of creating opportunities for new directors, do you think that shadowing is a useful experience uh, for folks wanting to break in? Do you think that like, are there alternatives to shadowing that you would encourage folks to follow uh, in terms of breaking in? I seen that th this is a question that seems to get, is getting a bit of a response. So I'm curious to hear what you had to say. Or just ignore my facial thing. Sharon, you take that one because my face. Well, I think this is obviously a touchy subject because many of us have shadow endlessly and has, it has not yielded any result. But something that I think has been useful for myself is always focus back on your craft. Do the thing that is actually gonna benefit you. If you're a student in film school and you've never been on a film set, shadow. Like do as much as you can to learn as much as possible. And if you think it, it will truly benefit you, do it. But if you're at a point where you know you can run the show, you know you can be at the helm. Shadowing isn't gonna do anything for you. If you think that maybe going on set for a day or two and meeting the producers is beneficial for you, um, for your business. Um, so look at your craft and look at your business, but it's gotta make sense for you to be doing that. And it's gonna be worth your time. So whether it's like taking six months or taking six days, that's very different too. So. You gotta weigh those those uh, benefits. I'll just toss in and say, I just this is the this is the dirty secret. Okay, you want to make something, go make it. Like that's it. Like try to make it. Like like you know like when I first started, like it was like still like film cameras. Like I couldn't afford that shit. But now there's cameras in our phones there's editing software that you can subscribe to you got you got your friends you got your peeps you got something you care about try to make it being a director is simply about having a vision and and the will to make that vision happen that's simply it i know it requires money but we all know we can you can eat you can eat craft dinner you can you know what i'm saying you can do whatever you got to do to make the vision come to life and it's really just about that. If you want to learn, talk to people. You want to shadow, go shadow, it's fine. But keep your eye on the prize and just make the thing because nobody's gonna make what you have in your head. That's just it. Uh, can I just um, say, say as well, I think a combination of what Sharon and, uh, and Tiffany and, and RT have said, and um, you know, I think it, it's a collaborative medium it's, you know, I think you've just got to, I, for me personally, you've got to get yourself out of the way sometimes and just talk to people and also be learning and listening. Uh, it's a constant, for me, it's a constant learning process. This evening's panel, I've learned a, a hell of a lot of people, the, my peer groups here talking and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not ashamed to say I want to get in touch with RT after this. I want emails for Ron because I'm trying to do a, a cop drama over here. Uh, and and Sharon and Tiffany, I'm going to get all of your addresses and try and and and, and keep in touch because I think there's probably going to come a time in the future when I'm going to want to pick your brains about stuff about this thing that we we're all into, this directing and filmmaking business. And that's how that's how the change happens, right? It's it's like building and connecting and building and connecting. Um, thank you, everybody. You're all awesome. This is.